Hello everyone. Many of you realize that I am making this video at a time in world history that is very, very trying, is a little scary and unpredictable. And this is the time of the coronavirus. It affects many, many countries, of course, here in the United States as well, it has affected many Yidden. And for us personally, who are about to begin to talk now about Fila, it affects us terribly because many, many shuls have closed because people are not allowed to congregate together. And not only the shuls are closed, the yeshivas are closed, the yakovs are closed. And the question is, why did this happen? Everything that happens, we know that Hashem is always sending a message. What message is there? So let me tell you a little incident that happened with me this past Friday night. And now in a neighborhood where I live in Kew Gardens, New York, there was a fellow who made a minion in his backyard. Of course, everybody stood away from each other. And after they davened Mincha Erev Shabbos, the gentleman came over to me and asked me to daven Myrif, to daven Kabbalah Shabbos. And I said, I'm sorry, I just can't. He asked me a second time, again I refused. And he got somebody else. And I'll tell you why I refused. Because I felt that as soon as I start davening, whether I say, or even later, I'm gonna cry. And you know why I was gonna cry? Because I was reminded of Gomorrah and Sukkah, Kof Chesamad Beis. The Gemara tells us that during the days of Sukkot, a person is supposed to make the Sukkah the permanent place where he eats and dwells, and his house is temporary. But what happens if it's raining? Then he's allowed to go out. Now, when is he allowed to go out? When it rains so much that the amount of water that comes into the soup is gonna spoil. And then the Mishnah, watch it, it's so amazing, does something it, it's hardly ever does in Shas. It says, I'll give you a marshal, a parable. It tells us, I'll give you a marshal about a servant who came to the master to bring him a cup of wine. And the master is unhappy. And he takes a pitcher of water and he throws it in the face of the servant. As if to say, get out of here, I don't want your wine. I don't want you here. And that's what the mission is saying. That's what happens when it rains on Sukkot. Hashem saying, I don't want you in the Sukkot the first night. Go out. I'm not pleased with you. And to me, that's so sad. When Hashem closed thousands of shuls around the world, is that what Hashem is saying to us? That I don't want you in my shul, why? And you know, there's a wonderful organization and it's called Stop the Talking. And I think that they have the answer. Maybe because every shul is a Migdash Ma'at. It's a mini Beis HaMikdash. And we have to treat it with their herits. And maybe we don't act properly. We talk too much in shul. We shouldn't be talking in shul during davening or any other part. Even before Baruch Shama and after Shemun Esra, after Chazar Shashatz, we should not be talking in shul. It's a holy place and we have to act with decorum, the way we dress, the way we act, the way we sit, the way we stand. And that's what this Living Lessons is all about, to show us the importance of tefillah. Now the Toysus Yantif, he made a special Misha Beirach, and I would like to read to you a part of it because I think it's so pertinent today. He says, anybody who's careful and watches himself, not to speak during davening or during Kriya Satayra, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yishmerehu, Hashem will watch him be called Tzara Vitsuka from any pain and any tragedy. We call Nega Machla any incident of illness and sickness. And then he's going to have all the brachas that the Nevi'im talk about. Don't we want the brachas? Don't we want the blessing of Hashem? We don't want a Nega Machla. Everybody's frightened about that. So I would say to you, my dear children, watch this carefully. There are five great stories here about the importance of coming on time, about the importance of thanking Hashem when you daven, being a role model when you daven, davening with a minion, and knowing that tefillah helps and Hashem listens to tefillah. Let's take this very seriously. No more talking in shul. Let us make ourselves welcome once again that Hashem in a sense will open up His arms and embrace us in his Bote Knesiyos and his Bote Midrashos, that we should be able to daven, and daven with Kavona, and daven with Erlachkeit, and then accomplish 
that Hashem will answer our utmost vila to bring us with Mashiach to Yerushalayim Erech The first story that I would like to tell you is called Tfila Works. A while ago, my wife and I were in Muncie for Shabbos. Muncie is a very, very Jewish neighborhood. On Motza Shabbos, I had to travel from Muncie to Lakewood, which is 80 miles away, because I had a speaking engagement at a Yeshiva Malava Malka dinner. Now, just so that you're familiar with the highway system, when you're traveling from Muncie to Lakewood, one of the ways to go is to get on the Palisades Parkway, then on the New York Thruway, then on the Garden State Parkway, then Route 9, and then you're in Lakewood. That's the route we were taking. But when we got onto the Palisades Parkway, even on the ramp before we got on the highway, all of a sudden my wife who was driving noticed that the car ahead of us, the hatch, the back hatch, opened up and out came a hat box, out came a suit box, out came a crib, and out came a valise, and out came a shaito box, all the things that a Jewish family would need for Shabbos. Not only that, my wife started blowing the horn to try to get their attention. But they were flying so fast and we had to get onto a different highway. Well, there was no way we could follow them. Besides, everything was right there on the ramp. We couldn't even drive by it. So my grandson and I got out of the car, piled everything in, and I started looking for some identity on the outside of some of these things. And I learned a very important lesson that night. Never put your home telephone number on a suitcase that you're traveling with because if you're traveling, you're not home. What good is it if somebody's going to call you at home and you're not home? Put your cell phone. Well, that family had their home phone. I called up and I said like this. Hello, this is Rabbi Pesach Kron. Please do not lose your shalom bias over this. Don't get into an argument with each other because soon you're going to find out what happened that everything fell out of the car. The husband shouldn't blame the wife that she left the hatch open and the wife shouldn't blame the husband that he left the hatch open because I have everything. We saw everything fall out. We picked it up. Just call us and we'll get it back to you because we see that you live in Brooklyn and we'll be able to get it to you. Well, I thought for sure I was going to get a call right away, but I didn't. Three hours went by. I was positive they would get the message and call, but they didn't. I went to Lakewood. I gave the speech. I was coming back. I was on the big, gorgeous, beautiful Verrazano Bridge. It's after midnight, and I got a call. And a lady's yelling on the other side of the phone, Rabbi Crow, I can't believe you got all my stuff. I said, ma'am, where you been for the last three hours? I tried to call you. She said, well, my cell phone was dead and I was at my nephew's bar mitzvah. So I figured nobody's calling me anyway because we got the whole family here. But I was so sad. I was sitting and I was moping because I lost so much stuff. And suddenly my sister came over to me. My sister was a little bit upset with me because it was her son's bar mitzvah. And she said, look at your face. You look so sad, you look so down. Is that how you react at my son's bar mitzvah? This is a family simcha. Well, I said to her, I shouldn't be upset. I shouldn't be upset. I lost my shaitel. I lost the baby's crib. I lost my husband's hat. I lost his suit. I lost my valise and jewelry. And my sister said to me, boy, if you get all that stuff back, that's a Rabbi Pesach Kron story. And you know something? I come home and guess who's on the phone? You're on the phone. And I said, don't worry, it's no problem. We're on the Verrazano Bridge. We have to get to Queens, that's where I live, but we pass through Brooklyn. We'll bring you this stuff in a few minutes. And that's what we did. And that family was so happy because they got everything back. And you know what she told me? And this is the main part of the story. She said, when my sister told me what she did, I realized she was right. I had to change my mood. I went into a corner and I prayed to Hashem. I said, Hashem, you know I always give back anything that's not mine. If I owe even a quarter, I return it. Tonight, I lost so much. Please, Hashem, I always give back that which is not mine. 
please make sure that I get back that which is mine. And then I turned around, I became into a good mood. And then when I come home, look at that. Hashem answered my tefillah because you returned everything that I lost. This story I like to call Being Grateful. Many years ago, in 1979, there was a young man in Eretz Yisrael. His name was Hananya Shalak. He got married. But two months after he got married, Hananya's father-in-law had a terrible stroke and half of his body was paralyzed. Throughout the time that he was in the hospital, his new son-in-law, Hananya, became very, very familiar with what is going on in hospitals. And he started to notice things that were missing. And he realized that there were certain changes that could be made that would make a great difference, not only for the people that were ill, but for the people that were coming to be with those sick people. As a matter of fact, there was a girl, a young girl who was very sick and her parents had to be with her all the time. The mother would be there all day, the father would be there all night. And Hanan, you realize, you know, we really have to have volunteers so that somebody could be with this little girl and the parents would be able to have some rest. Well, after Hananya's father left the hospital, Hananya did not forget the lessons that he learned there. And he opened an organization called Azer Mitzion. Azer means help. Mitzion, Tzion is Eretz Yisrael. And you know something? This Azer Mitzion became one of the most important medical organizations in Eretz Yisrael. Today, Azer Mitzion has 58 different centers in 31 cities throughout Eretz Yisrael. They have over 16,000 volunteers and they help the handicapped, they help the elderly, they help young children and people who are never very, very sick. They even have a very big directory to help people who need bone marrow transplants and they can help a person find a donor. Well, many, many people around the world know about Azimitzion and it happened a number of years ago that a very wealthy man from Europe came to visit Hananya. He wanted to make a donation to the organization and he met everybody in Hananya's office. As they were talking, it was getting late already and it was getting towards evening. And Hananya said to the wealthy man, you know, I appreciate so much that you made the effort to come to our office and meet all of us and you made such a nice donation. Why don't we go to the Kaisal Maravi? Well, Davin Mayrev there, it's so beautiful to Davin Mayrev there. And don't forget, you don't get a chance to do that often. You live in Europe. So how often do you get a chance to come here? And he said, that's a wonderful idea, Hananya. When they got to the Kaisal, it was already nighttime. As they looked along the plaza and they saw the Kaisal, they could see a man standing near the wall his hands were outstretched and he was crying. He was davening. He was talking and crying to Hashem. They couldn't make out what he was saying, but it looked like the world was coming to an end. Hananya, who was such a wonderful person, turned to the wealthy man. He said, look at that fellow davening. We got to help him. If it's a medical issue, I'll try to help him. If it's a financial issue, are you willing to help him? And the gentleman said, of course, Hananya, I'll do whatever you tell me. Well, they go over to the gentleman after he finished davening. They said, good evening, Rabbi Yid. How's everything? He said, oh, everything is wonderful. He said, wonderful? It looked like the world was coming to an end the way you were davening. And the man smiled. He said, oh, no, 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 no. You guys have it wrong. You see, I have, my wife and I, we have a number of children. And last night, we married off our youngest child. And tonight... I came to the Kaisal Maravi just to say thank you to Hashem that he let my wife and I live to see the wedding of our youngest child. Wow, Hananya and this European gentleman were just overwhelmed. And they learned a great lesson. That's a lesson that we should learn. Of course, when things are difficult, we always cry out to Hashem. But what about when things are good? 
Do we thank Hashem the way we daven when things are difficult? That's what Maidim in Shmon Esra is all about. Maidim means thank you. Maidim anachnu lach. If you have parents, if you have friends, you have a great school, a great neighborhood, you have great clothes, whatever you have, that's wonderful. Thank Hashem. You know what it once occurred to me? The word Maidim, Mem Vav, Dalad Yud Mem. You know what it equals? A hundred. You know why? You gotta be thankful to Hashem for a hundred percent of what you have, all the wonderful things that you have. David HaMelech says, we say it in Hallel, Pischuli Sharei Tzedek, Ovoivom, open for me the gates of righteousness, the gates of the Beis HaMedrish, the gates of the Beis HaKnesses. Ovoivom, I'm gonna come there. You know what I'm gonna do? Oide Ko, I'm gonna say thank you to you, Hashem. In other words, David HaMelech is saying, I'm not just coming to Shul to ask for things, I'm coming to say thank you. That's what being grateful is all about. I like to call this story, It Was a Matter of Time. This story is about a young boy who lived in Baltimore. The boy's name is Moshe Doe Heber. Now, before Moshe Doe became Bar Mitzvah, he realized that he would soon be Mechuyev, obligated in all the mitzvahs. And Moshe Doe was very serious about his observance of the mitzvahs, especially davening with a minion. Moshe Dov made up his mind that from the time he becomes bar mitzvah, he will never daven without a minion, whether he was in yeshiva, whether he was in summer camp, or whether he was traveling. Moshe Dov's family, he, they loved to travel all over the United States, but they never traveled any place unless they knew they could make a minion for shacharis Mincha and Mayrgen. Now, this impressive young bocher grew up and he became a person who felt a responsibility in Achrayas for Klal Yisrael. And therefore, one summer, he joined what's called the SEED program. You know what it stands for? Summer Enrichment and Education Development. Now, in the year 2008, Moshe Dove went to Seattle and he joined the SEED program. He got to love the people in Seattle, and the people in Seattle loved him. So the next year, in 2009, he decided that he's going to take a four-day trip to Seattle to visit his friends. Well, on the day of the trip, Moshe Dov, Davin Shachris, and Mincha in Baltimore, and he was planning to make the final minion of Myriv in Seattle. The only thing was, he had to travel there by plane, and he was going to stop in Phoenix, but from Phoenix, he would get a plane to Seattle, and he should have made it on time. The problem was that on the way to Phoenix, there was terrible, terrible turbulence, and the plane could not keep up its regular speed, and it landed more than an hour and a half late. Moshe Dov was thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to miss that flight to Seattle and I'm gonna miss my Myriv minion. But when he landed finally in Phoenix, they said all planes are grounded. No planes are taking off for two hours. Well, that was good news and bad news. It was good news because he was gonna be able to get to Seattle, but it was bad news because who knows by the time the plane would take off, by the time he landed in Seattle, he would miss that minion. Well, he decided he's gonna try to look for a minion in the airport in Phoenix. He couldn't find one other Jewish person. And he sat down and he started crying because he realized that even if he gets on that plane from Phoenix to Seattle, by the time he comes, it's gonna be very, very late. And you know something? They finally got on the plane and the pilot made an announcement. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I just wanna tell you that because of our delay, we are 27th online so we're gonna be delayed Moshe Dov was sick to his stomach he had davened 6,500 minyanim in a row and didn't miss any of them and now he was gonna miss it well he called his friend Rabbi Bressler in Seattle to tell him how late he was gonna be and Rabbi Bressler said don't worry don't worry Max Price He's going to be in the airport no matter when you come. He'll be there to pick you up. Moshe Dov didn't even have the courage 
or the chutzpah to ask if they would wait to make a minion for him. He couldn't do that because he knew he was going to land maybe even close to midnight. Sure enough, hours later, the plane took off and it finally landed in Seattle. And sure enough, when he got to Seattle, Mr. Price was there waiting for him. Now, they got into the car and they started driving. Moshe Dove knew where he was staying, so he knew the highway system because he had been there the year before. And all of a sudden, Mr. Price, instead of making a left turn to where Moshe Dove was supposed to be staying, he was making a right turn. And Moshe Dov said to Mr. Price, are you sure you're going the right way? And Mr. Price said, just leave it to me. They made a right turn, a left turn, and a right turn. And there in front of him, it was one o'clock in the morning, was the Kailo. And the Kailo was all lit up. And the guys were standing outside. And Moshe Dov couldn't believe it. The guys had waited till one o'clock in the morning to make a minion for him just because they knew how much it meant that he should be able to daven with a minion. What a great group of fellows they were to be able to make sure that Moshe Dov could daven with a minion. When he saw them, he was speechless. And of course, he started davening Myra with them with tears in his eyes. I want to tell you something beautiful. In October of 2013, Moshe Dov got married. He got married to my granddaughter, Rachel Pfeiffer. And today, this wonderful young man, Moshe Dov Heber, is my grandson, and he's a Rebbe in Yeshiva Ketana of Waterbury. And I am so proud of him. I like to call this story, At the End I Come. I'm going to tell you a story about a furniture store in Milwaukee, but it didn't happen in Milwaukee, and it didn't happen in a furniture store. But I think that there's a great lesson to learn here. You see, this fellow, a young fellow in his 20s, owned a furniture store, and he sold many desks, beds, tables, curtains, and all the things that you would need in a home that are made out of wood. What happened one day, he came in about 9 o'clock, but by 10 o'clock he thought that he smelled some fire or smoke, and he ran downstairs, and he saw that the basement was on fire. And he had a fire extinguisher. He tried to put it out, but it just didn't work. The fire was too big. And by the time he came upstairs, the fire had come through the slats. And now the curtains were burning, and the tables were burning, and the chairs were burning. And he was yelling and screaming into the telephone. He was calling the fire department that they should come as soon as possible. And, of course, they did come, but not before his place was just about burned down. The only thing that they could save was the next door store. They hosed it down and they saved the next door store. Now this fellow told me it took more than six months until they were able to put back his store again. But then, you know, a couple days after the fire, he came to shul and he told a friend of mine this story. He said, you know what happened to me a couple days before the fire? I came to shul and a fellow came over to me and he said, you know, every day you come to shul, but every day you come late. Why do you come late every day? So I said to him, what's the difference? At the end, I come. He said, Hashem showed me. A few days later, at the end, the fire department, they also came, but it was too late. The store burnt down, but they were able to save the next door store. And I think that there's a great lesson here. At the end, I come is not good enough. Many, many times when we know that davening is seven o'clock in the morning, we come at 7 o'clock, but by that time they started brachas. So when we come every day to shul, we have to make sure to come on time. We have to know that when you come to shul, it's like visiting Hashem. And if you were visiting the great king, of course you would come on time. So at the end I come is not good enough. Let us make a dogosh chaza. That means let us make a firm commitment that from now on, if davening is at 7, we'll be there 10 to 7. So that when the chazan starts brachas, you'll be right there with them. And then Hashem will be able to listen to all our tefillahs, which we'll be able to say slowly and with kavanah. This story I like to call Delivering in Dallas. Many years ago, there was a young man named Rab Arya Roden 
who got smicha from Yeshiva Chavetz Chaim in Queens, New York. Now many, many of the musmochim of Yeshiva Chavetz Chaim, they go out to different cities all over the United States to help build Jewish communities. Some become rebbeim in schools, others get involved in Kirov, and some become rabbis of the communities. Now, Rab Arya Roden started a shul in his home in North Dallas, which is in the state of Texas. One afternoon, he was preparing a lecture for an adult education class, and there was a knock on the door. He opened the door, and standing there was a young man who he had never seen before. The young man introduced himself as Michael Froman. Michael and the rabbi got into a wonderful discussion about religion. And they must have spoken for about two hours. Afterwards, Michael, who was so impressed with Rabbi Roden, said, You know, Rabbi, I was so moved by everything that you told me that I am going to send your synagogue $2,000. And you know, Rabbi Roden told me that Michael didn't send $2,000. He sent $3,000. And then he began sending more money, and he began coming to shul, and eventually he became a Balchuva. He became a very orthodox young man. Eventually, because of all the money that was collected and donated, they were able to build a shul that is still there today. It's called the Young Israel of North Dallas. And yes, Rabbi Roden is still the Rav of that shul. Now, unfortunately, Michael Froman never got married. And when he was in his 40s, he had a massive heart attack and he passed away. At his funeral, his mother got up and she said, I am so grateful to Rabbi Roden and I am so grateful to this synagogue because through this synagogue and Rabbi Roden, my son came back to his roots. And she said, I am going to donate the exact amount that he gave to the shul over the years. And she wrote out a check for $50,000. Now, at the 30-day memorial service at the Shloshim, Rabbi Roden got up to speak, and he said something remarkable. He said, I remember the first day that Michael came, and I said to him, of all the shuls that you could have chosen in Dallas, why did you come to my shul? And he said, Rabbi, I'll tell you. I just got back from a trip to Israel. It's the first time that I was ever in Israel. The last night they took us to the Kosel Hamaravi, to the Western Wall, or what some people call the Wailing Wall. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to daven. All I knew is how to say Shema Yisrael. And that's what I did. I said Shema Yisrael. And I saw people put their name on a piece of paper and put it into the wall. That's what I did. But standing right next to me was a man who was praying. And he was praying with such intensity, I wished that I could pray like him. To tell you the truth, I was gonna give him some money, but that would have been embarrassing. So when I came back a day or two later to Dallas, I went into the bakery and I said to the gentleman behind the counter, I described that man who was praying at the Kosel Hamaravi at the wall. I said, if he came to Dallas, what synagogue would he pray in? And they said he would come and he would pray by Rabbi Roden. And that's why I came to your shul. And Rabbi Roden said an amazing thing. He said, imagine, because of the way that person was praying at the Kaisel, he had such a strong influence on Michael, and that man who was praying there didn't even know it. It turned out that because of him, Michael visited the rabbi, gave money to the shul, became a Baal Tshuva, got his friends to become Baal Tshuva, and they built the shul. So when that person, after 120 years, comes to Shemayim, Hashem is going to say to him, Rab Yid, because of you, so much good was done in Dallas. A shul was built in Dallas because of your davening. And he might say to Hashem, Hashem, I never heard of Dallas. I heard of dollars, but I never heard of Dallas. And Hashem is going to, of course, be right. Because Hashem is going to say, you know something? You were a role model, even though you didn't realize it. And that's the lesson we must learn from this story. Coming to shul is not only a privilege, it's a responsibility. People watch, and if you come on time, others are gonna come on time. If you don't talk in shul, others won't talk in shul. 
And if you are a parent and you bring your children with you, others will do the same. Let's remember, coming to shul to make a connection to Hashem is a great privilege, but it's also a responsibility. Let's take that responsibility seriously and daven with kavona, daven with proper intent, so we'll make a connection to Hashem and a connection to all those who learn from us.